Good, Good morning. morning. What, what a beautiful, beautiful autumn, autumn day. day. Stunning. stunning. Haven't we, we had, had some stunning autumn weather, weather the last week? week. I'm, I'm here, here to read the Bible reading, reading which, which comes, comes from, from Acts, chapter 10, 9 to 22. 22. Now, now, to set, set the scene, scene Cornelius, a centurion, centurion had sent men, men to Joppa to find Peter, Peter after direction, direction from an angel. Cornelius feared God, but there, there was a catch. He was, was a Gentile, unclean to the Jews. So let's, let's see what happens. About, About noon the following day, day that, that was, was after the angel, angel came, came, they, they that's Cornelius's um, people, people were on their journey and, and approaching, approaching the city. city. Peter, Peter went up on the roof, roof to pray. He became, became hungry and wanted something, something to eat. eat. And, and while the meal was, was being prepared, he fell into, into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by his four corners. By its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get, Get up, Peter, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They, they called, called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Um, Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for, why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius, a centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. And Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading. Now, Mitch... Come out here. This, this is, is Mitch. Mitch. This, this is, is very poetic. Mitch, Mitch from Morrisette. Morris. How does that sound? <laughs> Mitch is the youth pastor there. there. Isn't that, that right, Mitch? Yeah, that's absolutely. Yeah, and you've, you've been, been there a couple, couple of years, years or a bit, bit more. Or? Sorry, I'll just turn this on real quick. Um, I, I, I realised the other day I've been there for five years. Uh, this is our fifth, fifth, fifth year this year. So oh, my goodness. What a long time. And how's it going down there? Good. Good. Everything's obviously, you just got to know, it's all different. Post-COVID, we're well, well, still, still in COVID, COVID but, but uh, yeah, yeah, so it's, it's all, all a bit different. different. Um, but, but yeah, yeah everything's going pretty, pretty well, well so far. far. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, thank, thank you, you for coming, coming this morning, and let's, let's pray, pray for you. you. Dear Heavenly, Heavenly Father, Father, we thank, thank you that, that Mitch has been able to come and fill in while Chris is on leave. And we just pray now as he brings your word to us that you will open our eyes to the truth of it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. Uh, I appreciate, appreciate you filling in a bit of the, the story there too. too. Um, I'm, I'm actually, actually going to be preaching basically from that whole story in Acts 10, but I thought it was a bit rude to be a guest preacher somewhere and ask someone to read the whole, whole chapter. I thought that, I thought that was a bit nasty to do something like that. that. So, so I appreciate you filling, filling in some, some, some extra details, details there. there. That, that was good. Thank you. Um, just before, before I get away, just, just because it's pretty much 99.9% of you have no idea who I am except from Mitch from Morissette. Um, but I, be, I became a Christian when I was 20, uh, so a lot of those Sunday school songs you were just, just doing there, I, I have to admit, I have no idea what was going on there. Uh, so, but it was good. It was good. I got a bit of an education. It was nice. Um, and, and yeah, I've been out at Morissette for the, for the last five years. Um, I've been married. It'll be eight years this year, been, been married with my wife. Um, we have not long had our, our third child. We have two girls and a boy. We have a Five-year-old Lily, a, a three-year-old Chelsea, and a six-month-year-old James. Uh, and so I was just sharing before with um, another Mitchell here, your, your treasurer, that um, once we've had third, I feel like we're, we've all of a sudden aged about 30 years. Uh, so I've gone from 32 to, to 62, um, and we take midday naps, which has never happened in my life, and it's amazing. So that's just a bit about myself and, and just the journey we're on at the minute out of Morissette and just in our lives in, in general. 
Uh, but let's pray just before we, we get into the, the sermon this morning. Father, I just continue to, to remember and, and to thank you of how great it is to live in a nation that we can have church buildings, that we can join together, that our nation has actually done pretty well with COVID, and that we get to, to sing together and we get to come together to, to learn about you and to praise you and to honour you and to focus on you. And I pray that as we have our time together this morning, that it doesn't stop just here, that we realise that as we wake up on Monday morning, that it is all to, to live for you and to live for your glory and to, to further your kingdom, Lord. And we just want to be a part of what you already have going on. We just want to listen to your spirit's leading that you've given us, Lord. And I pray that as we continue to worship and, and look into your word this morning, that we'll continue to, to take this with us as we go. Lord. Amen. So we have this, this really great story here in Acts 10. And I, I actually really like preaching from this just not too long after Easter, because it's, in fact, not too long since Jesus actually rose again, and then he spent time on earth for about 40 days before he ascended into, into heaven. And so there's a lot that's happened in that time. The disciples and, and a lot of other people have been given the Holy Spirit, and that's all new and exciting and happening. And at the same time, they're also kind of getting chased around the place as people are trying to arrest them and, and persecute them. And so there's a lot happening around this time, and Peter finds himself in a really interesting scenario. But what I want to start with is, is a question. I'm going to ask you a question, I'm going to share a story to give you a minute to think, because something I do like to do while I'm preaching is have a, a bit of an engagement, a bit of a conversation. Um, and the question is going to be, what's your genuine fear? Something that when maybe it hasn't approached you, and, and that's a good thing, but maybe something that when it does approach you, it's, it's a step too far, it's a little too much. What's your genuine fear. And I'm going to share with you mine because it's unfair to ask you and then not share with you. My genuine fear is heights. I have a proper fear of heights. A lot of people say, oh yeah, I'm a bit scared of heights. I'm actually proper scared of heights um, ever since I was a little boy. I have no idea why. I don't know if anything happened to me when I was young. My parents won't tell me. So who knows? They might be covering something up. I have no idea. Um, but I have a genuine fear of heights. And so I'm really silly though with my fears because I'll see something that looks exciting and all of a sudden I'll forget about the fact that I'm scared of something like that. And I'll find myself halfway towards doing something like maybe swinging off a tree or I don't know, something silly that I've done in my life. And I'll kind of get halfway there and go, hang on, I'm actually really scared. And I'm not just scared, I'm actually terrified. I'm not just terrified, but I'm actually just going to get back down because I really can't do that. Uh, there's been many times where there was at a, a school excursion or, or just something out where I found myself in a high position and I went, wow, I'm stupid. I know I'm scared of this and yet why am I up here? And I have that moment where I go, yeah, nah, I can't do it. I'm, I'm getting down. And I'm very silly because I thought I was going to have a great time when I was 21. There was a bunch of kind of important birthdays in my family. We're pretty much half of us born in May. And so May's a bit of a crazy time in my family. And there was a bunch of big birthdays and mine being the 21st and a few others. And so we decided to go skydiving because that's so exciting. And I was, I, I'm telling you now, I'm really silly. Um, and so I thought, that's great. I've seen so many cool video clips of that and it looks awesome. I'm going to go skydiving. And so it was, was two of my sisters, I have three sisters, two of my sisters um, and myself and my mum went. My dad was really smart. He stayed on the ground. Um, my other sister was over in a different state. Um, and so we, my two sisters went first, looked pretty cool from what I could see. Um, we got in the plane, my, my mum and I, and always, you know, as the, you, you try and be cooler than your parents, right? Like I was trying to be cooler than my mum and she had the biggest smile. Like she was so excited. She's like, Mitch, I haven't done this, something like this in, in ages. This is awesome. I can't, I can't wait. And as soon as the plane, the plane started to, to circle around in the air, I just went white. I was like, this is the dumbest thing I could have ever done in my life. To the point where I wouldn't exit the plane door. The guy had to, like the guy that was strapped on my back had to really push. I was clinging on real tight. And it was a genuine moment of absolute fear. I was, I was really panicking. Uh, and as I said before, I'm a bit silly, I'm a bit stupid because then I decided that when my wife turned 30, I'd take a skydiving <laughs> because she always wanted to go skydiving and Seriously, just as we were getting our gear on, 
all those memories came back and I went, I don't think I want to do this anymore. And she saw me again, just turn white. She said, you, you can just skip out if you want. And then my brilliant instructor said, yeah, but if you skip out, you're a bit of a sook. <laughs> so I had to go and do it. And he paid me out the whole time. But very seriously, I have a, I have a proper fear of heights. So from you guys, what's some, some genuine fears in your life where you go, that is just, it's a bit too far. You might still do it, but gee, it is absolutely terrifying. Anyone got some fears like that going on? Dogs in the street? Yeah, you're terrified of dogs? That's fair enough. Some of those things look scary. I understand that. Snakes? Yes. Wrong country to be living in, but yes. <laughs> Going caving? Yeah, so kind of a claustrophobic sort of, sort of feeling. Yeah, that's a pretty big one. Anything else? One more out there? Sorry? Very fast rides? Yep, yep. Again, can't avoid those too much when you go to shows, um, other than just walk in the other direction. You can? That's good. You're, you're obviously smarter than I am. It's good we've established that. The reason I want to, to talk about fears is because there's actually a real genuine fear for Peter in this story. There's a real genuine fear. It's more of a social fear, though. And I don't know if anyone would be able to remember moments in your life where you've had some sort of social fear. I certainly remember in high school and, and places like that, there was a lot of social fears. If you said something silly and people would rip on you for the next week and if you did something that was embarrassing, then you'd become known for that thing. There's a lot of social anxiety and social fears going on in schools and really that continues into the workplace and, and many other places you find yourself. But Peter had some social issues going on here. And I want to show a, a short uh, video clip here that kind of explains what his fear could potentially end up like. We've got a short clip here from a, from a film. Everyone, make way for my dad. Uh, I mean, the stonekeeper. Sorry, Dad. I mean, stonekeeper. Come on, Thorpe, you blew it. Good morning, everyone. Hey, how are you? Oh, boy. Is this about me go missing the gong? Stonekeeper, he, he saw a small float. I'd still be out there. He said it fell from the sky. Gary, calm down. You know how you get. Okay, I'll try, but I'm just so scared. Now, I know Migo has gotten you all very anxious with his little story, but there's nothing to fear because it isn't true. Yeah. But I, I saw one. No, you didn't. I, I did. You can't have seen it because it doesn't exist. I know, I know. Because the stone says there's no such thing as a small foot. Yep, right there. Clear as day. I know, but it was right there in front of me. Hey, Migo, how did you know it was a small foot? Because it had a small foot. Uh, Dad? Daddy, clearly he saw something. Oh, I'm not denying he saw something. Most likely he slipped, hit his head, got confused, and saw a yak. Oh, okay, I get it now. Because if Migo is saying he saw a small foot, then he's saying a stone is wrong. Ah, uh, is that what you're saying, Migo? That a stone is wrong? No, he is not saying that. Hey, let me talk to him. <laughs> Kids, right? Mika, what are you doing? Challenging the stonekeeper? In front of the whole village? Dad, what's the piece of advice you're always giving me? Do what you're told. The other one. Blend in. The other one. Follow the stones. Be a cog. Do your part. Never disagree with the stonekeeper. Always be true. That was about hitting a gong. Not challenging a stone. Because if it goes against a stone, it can't be true. But if I say I didn't see a small foot, then I'm lying. Migo, I thought you wanted to be the next gong ringer. I do. Then are you still saying the stone is wrong? If saying I saw a small foot means that a stone is wrong, then I... I guess I am. Oh. Oh, Migo. It pains me to say this. It truly does. But you leave me no choice. Disobeying the stones is a grave offense. From this day forward, you will be banished from the village. <gasps> what? Until you are ready to stand before us all and tell us the truth. I am telling the truth. That's all, everyone. 
Back to work. Let's make it another perfect day. Stonekeeper, please. That's my son. Just give him a little time alone out there to think. He'll come to his senses. There's a little clip there from a, from a movie that I came to love as my kids were watching it a hundred times. Um, does anyone know what, what that movie is by any chance? It's called Smallfoot, yes. <laughs> and the scene there that we have, is, it's pretty simple. There's one of them has, has seen something that apparently doesn't exist and it goes against the, the laws and the rules that they live by and so they can't accept it as, as being true because it goes against their laws. And I find it really interesting that that character actually wears all the, lo the laws on, on his body as if, as if it's clothing. You have an interesting scenario happening there where that, that character has everyone turn their backs to him and go, well, if you're going to go against that law, then, then you can't be a part of our community. And the truth is he doesn't really fit in anywhere else. There's no one else for him to exist. And Peter has the exact same scenario in front of him right now. Is he's seen a vision here, which you can see in the, the image there, He's seen a vision of animals that he is not meant to be touching at all, according to the, the rules and the laws that have been handed down through his, his community in the, in the Jewish community, and they were given to them in, in the old covenant, so it's not like this is just totally made up on their own. This is something that is set in concrete. They're like the, the stones. They don't change. They are there. And so Peter has to wrestle with this vision that he's been given by God, and it says there, he even says, surely not, Lord. Like, this can't be happening. I've gone through enough. I've seen, I've seen Jesus die, rise again. He was here for 40 days, and then he leaves again. I've seen everything that happened at Pentecost with the Holy Spirit. We've been persecuted, been chased away from our homes. Can we, can we maybe slow down for a minute, and, and can we not change this law? Because changing that law means that potentially I lose my community. I lose a part of my identity and what I grew up in and what I've been a part of. God set out these laws back in Leviticus 11 and, and Deuteronomy 14. I'm not going to go through and read them all because that would take way too long, but you can, you can do that later if you like. But he set out this criteria for, for clean and unclean animals. And there's a lot of other things that were given to, to separate them, to show them as God's chosen people. And so even after Christ has, has been and they have salvation through Christ, a lot of Jewish Christians would continue to follow these, these laws because that's what set them apart to show them that they were God's chosen people. And there's nothing inherently wrong with, with that until it gets to the point where maybe it stops you from following a direction from God. Because there's no doubt that Peter sees this as a direction from God. We can read it, we can see it. Peter obviously knows it because then what's about to take place really shows that all of this is being led by God and it's new and it's different and it's scary. And there's a lot of fear here for Peter and just what might actually take place. And it's important to understand that God isn't really changing in all of these scenarios. God isn't actually changing the, the law on, the, on what is clean and unclean that much, but he's preparing Peter for a moment where he's going to have to be able to be a bit brave and have a lot of faith and, and belief in, in where the Holy Spirit's leading him. And so we have this image of, of the vision from Peter and everything that he's wrestled with here. And we know that when God says something needs to happen, that ultimately the only thing we need to do is say, yeah, right. I'm fearful of that. I'm worried about it. It's scary, but I'm going to take that leap. I'm going to jump out of that plane. It seems really stupid to do. And it's very scary to do, but I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to do it. And it's amazing how much happiness you actually have during that experience. Certainly still plenty of fear, but there's a lot of happiness and a lot of joy and a lot of life happening within that time. And so the rest of the story pretty much goes something like this. Peter is led by these men to go to a man called Cornelius. And the plot starts to thicken because Cornelius is not just any old person. He's a Roman centurion. And when you look back at what had been happening during that time, the, the Romans and, and the Christians weren't exactly getting along. In fact, it was quite the opposite of that. And that continued through, through that time in, in history where a lot of the times the Christians were being chased away or maybe even the whole Jewish community was being chased away 
from believing in and following God. The, the Roman emperors were, were often quite fearful of anyone else who could potentially take over their, their empire. And so, of course, Jesus and anyone who believed in him was feared because, well, Jesus did something that no one else could do. He died and rose again. And then 40 days later, he decided, oh, I'm just going to leave. It's time for, time for me to go. But guess what? I'll give, give all these Christians a, a gift in the Holy Spirit. And they started to do things very similar to what Jesus did. They were able to heal people through the, the power of the Holy Spirit. They were teaching the, the truth on, on what's happening here. And so there was certainly a great element of tension between what was happening in that empire at that time. And I'm sure the Romans were terrified of what was going on there. And so you have this moment where Peter is being led to Cornelius' house and he doesn't know what we've read. And that is that Cornelius actually fears God. He, he actually wants to know God. He's actually been spending time praying to God. Peter has no idea. We can read that and go, oh, what's Peter so afraid about? This is all set up beautifully. This is perfect. Peter has no idea this is going on. And so he walks into the house and I, I love some of the words that he speaks as he gets to the house. It says in verse 28, if you have your Bibles open there, it says, He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. Straight away, as he even walks into the house, he straight away points out the fear that he has. Straight away, he says, I am not meant to be here. And he doesn't say, I'm scared of being here, but you get the sense that he's saying, I'm not meant to be here. Can you please let me leave? Because this is wrong. This is, goes against everything I, I grew up with. And, and this, is, this is actually a scary moment because I don't know what you're going to do to me. I don't know what's happening here. He goes on in that same verse to, to quickly say, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. And so as he's gone on this journey, between, somewhere between getting the vision of the, the unclean animals and, and getting to Cornelius' house, he's in this double-minded point of view where he's going, I'm scared, I'm not meant to be here, I know that's wrong. But then the other side, he's going, but God's shown me it's right and that I should be here. And previously, I'd look at you Gentiles and say, you're a bunch of unclean, horrible, nasty people. But now I'm meant to look at you and go, you are clean and you are, you're to be my brothers and sisters in Christ. That's a massive turnaround, a massive turnaround. And so as he's standing in the house, I wonder if we can have that, that picture back up there, sorry. As he's standing in the house there, you see in the picture, everyone's happy, right? There's not a picture, no one's created a picture of just before where it shows Peter maybe with a lot of tension walking into that house and maybe everyone's staring at him wondering what, what's about to happen. They only ever make happy pictures uh, when you're looking on Google. Um, but I can imagine there's actually a lot of tension before they get to some sort of happy place here. And so Peter's declaring those words. And then what transpires next is that Cornelius explains to him the fact that he's been praying to God and he's been, he was told to, to seek him out and that something, something's meant to, to happen in this moment. And so Peter's standing in this house, and it's not just him and Cornelius, but there's the idea that the house was actually full. And people have tried to put a number around it, and a lot of people have kind of guessed at about 40 about 40 people in the house, and they were most likely other sort of Roman dignitaries of, of some kind, so people that had some sort of authority or, or power. And so I can imagine Peter mightn't have known who they were, but they would have been dressed maybe in a particular way that showed their, their stature in, in society. So I can imagine that perhaps the fear only mounted a little bit for Peter. And then you have this fantastic moment in verse 47 and 48. Uh, sorry, 44, I'll start with, where after Peter has been teaching them everything they've wanted to know, he's been answering questions and he's been teaching them all about what it means to have salvation through Christ and what it means to follow him. You have this fantastic moment in verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message, on everyone in the house, however many there were. There was at least a, a decent gathering. All within the house, they received the Holy Spirit. And that's where you definitely would have the happy smiling faces like, like in the picture there. 
There's this great moment where Peter has addressed a very real fear in his life and understanding that God is, is telling him to push past it and he doesn't need to see the whole story of, of what's about to happen, but he just needs to, to trust in God that he's not leading him to a bad thing, but he's in fact leading him to something that's just fantastic and, and great. And so as he's standing in that building, Peter finally gets to see the thing that God had had in place from the very beginning. As Peter got the vision originally, as Cornelius had been praying to God, God already had all of this in plan and in mind, and Peter just needed to follow the Spirit's leading. The whole house was filled with the Holy Spirit. It goes on to say, Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they asked Peter to stay uh, with them for a few days. And that verse 47 kind of fascinated me for a bit there. It says, surely no one can stand in the way. Who would be standing in the way of them saying they can't receive the Holy Spirit or they can't be baptized? Who is he thinking of there when he's saying these words? I tend to think that maybe it's, it's those, that perhaps the Jewish community or, or, or other Christians who would say you shouldn't mix with those Gentiles, all those, all those Roman centurions. You shouldn't mix with those people. I get the sense here that as he's speaking those words, he's kind of almost saying to them that, hey, I, when, I, when I go and tell you about this story, it, it almost doesn't matter whether you agree with it or not. This was a moment in, in God where I saw something new and where I got to see the Holy Spirit in action and we got to see new people coming to Christ, people that we would see as unclean, and now clean. And we know that story in and of ourselves. When we think of our, our life before knowing Christ, maybe for some of you that was at a very, very young age, um, but we still think of those moments in our life where we go, yeah, without Christ, I, I, I can't be, be clean in, in God's eyes. And here's a moment where Peter gets to see people made clean who he thought that possibly could never be made clean, who he thought he couldn't really socialise with, he couldn't trust, he couldn't speak with, he couldn't tell the story of Jesus because who knows, he might end up in prison for it. He might end up being persecuted for it. And so this is an amazing moment. And so then the trick is, I guess, for us is to go, well, when is it right for us to, to point out something that maybe needs to, to change a little bit? When is it right to look at something and go, well, hang on, that rule or that law that we have that maybe we, we, we wear ourselves isn't actually something that's, that's necessary for my salvation, but it's just crept in there somewhere, and maybe it's actually holding me back from following something that that's God is, is leading me to do. What is it in, in our lives, in individually or as, as families or whatever the, your scenario might be, something that you go, well, why is that stopping us from spreading the news of, of Jesus to someone else? Maybe a, a complete stranger, maybe someone you already know. And I was thinking about this just, just the other day as I was reading through my sermon and I realized there was a moment in, in, in my life and, and with a friend of mine that we kind of busted a bit of a myth. We didn't realize we were doing it. Um, for a church out at, out at Curry Curry, we were helping out Curry Curry Baptist, what feels like ages ago now. Uh, as young 20-year-olds, we'd moved out there and, um, and they had asked for, for some help with, with running ministries and so we were running your, your kind of typical kids and youth ministries and, and started a second service to be a little bit more contemporary um, and, and we're really engaging well with the community there. And then for a little while, my, my friend and I started going to one of the pubs in Curry Curry because we've been doing a lot of, I guess, thinking and praying about, well, where is it that we need to be within the community? And you'd think a pub, maybe not the best place, but when, if you've ever been to Curry Curry, I don't know if ever you, any of you have been out that way or stayed out that way, there is pretty much a pub on every corner. Uh, so it is the community hub of Curry Curry. Uh, it truly is. If it's, not a, if it's not a pub, it's a bottle-o. Um, it's one or the other pretty much on every block. Um, and so we found ourselves kind of just jumping around, having lunch here and there at a, at a pub and, and just praying about where it is that maybe we're meant to find a space. In the, we had no idea what we were doing, no idea what to look like, but we just kept trying to listen to the Holy Spirit and go, we feel like there's one of these places we're meant to be. So we landed at this particular pub 
and we had the most amazing welcome, almost like you were walking into a church where the publican just came and met us at the front door, said g'day, walked in. He basically shared his whole life story with us. We went, dude, can I just have some lunch? What? I don't understand what's going on here. Uh, I'm, I'm confused. Um, and we're already a bit scared because we weren't really pub people. It's, it wasn't really the, the, the thing we did normally. So this was kind of new for us. And so as we were walking in there, we had this great reception, had, a, had some lunch, had something to drink, and everything was nice. And then after a little while of just going there, maybe once every few weeks, and all of a sudden, before we knew it, within the space of a couple months, we were running a beer and Bible at the pub. Seven o'clock on a Wednesday night, we'd fire up the sausage sizzle out the back, um, and people would just join with us out the back, and we'd look at the Bible, and we'd just kind of pick a particular passage that we thought might, might suit, and we'd explain what's going on there, and, and we'd talk about it, and people would come ask questions, and a lot of people would just kind of walk by and basically go, what on earth are you doing? You're in a pub, what, what's going on? Um, and we are so well received to the point where they asked us if we wanted to put flyers around the church to let people, around the, um, the, the pub building to let people know that this is on on a Wednesday night. We like, sure, okay, yeah, if you want to, do you want to advertise that? You want to advertise that there's a Bible study group at your pub on a Wednesday night? All right, I'm not going to say no. Sure, that's, that's fine. And it was a really fascinating time because, to be honest, my, my mate and I, we didn't really know what was going on. We didn't know what the end picture of all this was like. We didn't know where it was headed and we didn't know who would encounter and what we were really meant to be doing. And to be honest, we did have some, some genuine fears going on there. There were certainly some nights where there were people we really didn't want to come near us. There were people that... To look at you, just be scared. You go, oh, yeah, yeah, you can stay over there. That's okay, okay. Go over to the pool table. That's that's good. Um, there was definitely moments like that, um, and there were certainly some some great interactions with people who maybe had been there for a few hours already um, and had a few of those beverages from uh, from across the bench there, um, and certainly came and asked some interesting questions and had some interesting conversations. And what was interesting through all of this and and really exciting for us is that we knew in, in this whole time that this was something from God. There's no way in our thinking did we ever go, oh, this would be so cool. This would be really cool for two young guys to, to just to get in there and try and start a Bible study at a pub. No pub would let you run a Bible study. It's crazy. They're not there for that. They're there to, for many other things. And so all of a sudden we found ourselves in a position where we didn't know where this was meant to be heading, what we were meant to do, how long this would even last for. And it turns out it did have a, a time period to it. It only lasted about a year and a half. And what was really cool is that during that time as we were doing ministry elsewhere, doing kids ministry and youth ministry and, and being at the church on Sunday, inevitably a lot of people started to ask questions. They go, you're all these guys that run that Bible study group at a pub. Why are you running a Bible study group at a pub for? Well, actually, the Holy Spirit kind of led us there. We, we weren't even really planning it. We didn't even know what to, what to do with it. It just happened. And so there's moments in life, and that's probably a bit of an extreme example, but there's moments in life where it's right and appropriate to let something go. Because I've been taught by my nan as a young person to not even walk past a pub. My nan, I love her. She used to walk across the road to go past a pub. She was brought up that way. You just don't go near a pub. Now, I don't think there's no, really anything inherently evil about a pub. I think it's okay to go and have a drink. That's right. Getting drunk, yeah, it's another scenario. But my nan was so strict with all this. When I told her what we were doing, because she's a Christian woman, she was horrified, absolutely horrified. I explained it, I explained it, I explained it. I think, I think she kind of got okay with it, but never really happy with it. Um, and so this is a massive moment in her life where similar to what we saw in that movie clip, there was, a, there was a rule, there was a law that she had, there was a stone that she had, and she had to actually question, well, hang on, if something good is happening, if the Holy Spirit is, is working in a pub, then maybe it's actually not so bad. Maybe it's not the worst thing in the world, and maybe I need to lay that aside, and maybe it's okay. Maybe there's something special happening here. Maybe God's saying to these young guys, go and be there. And Peter was going through the exact same thing, where he was having to in himself go, this, this law that I know is true and, 
and right from how I grew up, maybe it's a stone that at least for a little while I need to sit down and go, okay, I need to, I need to move past this. I need to move beyond this. There's something more important here that, that God wants me to be, to be doing and, and God wants me to be a part of. Because honestly, that's, that's what God does in our lives. He's inviting us to become a part of his kingdom advancing on earth. And a lot of the time, I think we kind of get into that zone of going, yeah, I just do my, my thing as a Christian. Obviously, I go to church on Sunday. I might go to a home group or a Bible study group or, or whatever it is. And we very easily get into a kind of routine and a habit. And here in this story, we see God just absolutely blowing Peter's up and going, well, yours is going to completely change. But at the same time, he's doing that to Cornelius and everyone else that was in the house there and saying, well, your routine is going to completely change. Because you, you have the Holy Spirit here at work in, in their lives, Cornelius and all those in the house. It's brand new. It's fresh. Things are different. Things are changing. And really, that's where we find ourselves today as, as Christians, especially with everything that's happened with COVID. Just about every church person I've talked to from whatever church they're at, they're all saying it's just different. It's just different. Things are just different. And we need to be open to the, to the Holy Spirit's leading in, in what that means. It might mean that there's a few things that we've always done or we've always kind of not said, but they're just there, they're just true, that maybe we need to start to look at and go, well, is that something we still need to hold on to? Or can we lay that down and, and, and can we be okay with that? The important thing is, is that we always make sure that it's under God's direction, not any sort of cool, fancy idea of our own, and we think this is going to be awesome, but it's under God's direction. It was funny to, to hear how many people from, from other churches and different settings would say to us, oh, wow, you guys are so crazy to be running a, a Bible study group in a pub. That's so cool. I wonder if we could do that. So you don't want to do that. It's actually not that easy. It sounds fun. It's not that fun. It has to be from the Holy Spirit. It has to be a leading from the Holy Spirit. It has to be from God. So where does this, this leave us in, in this story? Ultimately, we see that that, that that vision that, that Peter's been given is not really actually about food laws as much as it is about reaching a new group of people with the story of Christ, with salvation that they need. We know that we need God, but we also need to recognize that there's those all outside and around us that, that also need him. We don't know what's happening in their lives. Peter didn't know Cornelius had been praying to God and, and seeking out him. We need to be prepared to, to be listening to the Holy Spirit and to move wherever it is that he needs us to move to and, and to talk to. It can be horribly fearful. It is horribly, horribly fearful. It doesn't matter how many times you might have talked to someone before or, or anything like that. It's always scary. But there is certainly a moment where you almost need to be stupid with your fear and go on that second skydive, even though you remember what the first one was like, and go, well, that was horrible and, and, and just the worst idea ever, but almost be silly enough to go and do it again knowing that you'll have a moment there with God where you go, wow, that was the best thing in my life. That was absolutely incredible. And then you can share that. You can share it in church. You can share it at home groups. You can share it all over social media. You can share that, and it only encourages Christians even more to understand and to know that God is real and God is working. So I've got a, a question here on the... Um, on the screen here, if we can, if we can have this, this last image up. And it's something I've, I've heard people say many times. You know, it's one thing to understand that we need God. It's another to, to actually follow him. And something I've been doing with my sermons recently is, um, is, is trying not to leave on a, a kind of flat note and a, and, a full, and a full stop because I feel that maybe inhibits us from taking it with us during the week. But something I wanted to do this morning is I wonder if maybe just – in small groups near each other, maybe if you have to turn around or, or, or something like that, just have a few minutes where you're praying for the, for the other people in, in that group that you'd be brave enough and, and strong enough and faithful enough to see the fear but then, but then look past it and be following God in, in whatever action it is that he's asking you to, to take. So I wonder if to get really uncomfortable this morning, like Peter was walking into Cornelius' house, what if you can get uncomfortable this morning? You might need to move a little bit. Um, I think I should probably say you're meant to still do COVID distancing. I should say that. Good luck. And I'll give you some time to pray and then I'll, then I'll wrap up in prayer as well.
Let me pray for you as we move into a, a time of worship here. And if you, if you didn't get to finish praying with each other, can I encourage you to, to do that even over morning tea? Father, I just want to continue to, to spend time in, in worship with you, Lord, and we, we want to continue to worship you and praise you, Lord. And as we've read through this story and this passage, we've seen the, the interaction that Peter has had with Cornelius and the household and the fears that would have been in his life there. Father, I pray that as Christians as a whole, that we would not let fears hold us back, would not let worries or concerns hold us back, but we'll continue to trust in you and, and believe in you and understand that some of those fears are, are very legitimate, but they should not be holding us back from being a part of, of your kingdom and, and that we would accept that invitation to see you in action in this world, Lord, and that we would not miss out on that and we would not be too scared to be a part of what you have going on, Lord. I pray for, for Toronto Baptist Church that they would take this with them and that all during the week as they wake up, they'll be praying that, Father, yes, I might be scared, but please help me to be brave enough to follow through and to trust in you to be praying for opportunities to see your spirit in action and to join in with that, Lord. Amen.